Okay, well, I want to uh, start by thanking the Headland Center for the Arts, where, as Samantha said, I'm currently an artist in residence, and also the San Francisco uh, Public Library for this opportunity to be able to read to you today, so thank you. And uh, I'm going to read from um, each of my um, um, three books. So I'm going to start with um, a poem from my first book, American Dreams, and I'll uh, start, I'm just going to read one poem from there. So I'll try to make that one a good one. I'm going to read um, Wild Thing. And uh, Wild Thing was written in 1989. And uh, it was a poem um, written after um, a group of young um, African American and Hispanic males were um, uh, running through the park. And they were um, engaged in um, just some kind of homicidal behavior. And they uh, allegedly attacked a um, a female jogger, a, a white woman in Central Park. And this, uh, and uh, also uh, evidently raped her. Uh, and this really, at that time, divided the city. And of course, uh, everybody was really shocked by this, um, this crime and, and the youth of the, um, of the perpetrators. Of course, since then, there's been Littleton and Arkansas and even uh, younger people and more horrendous crimes. In this uh, poem, I take on the persona of the young male, um, young male. Wild thing. And I'm running, running wild, running free, like soldiers down the beach, like somebody just threw me the ball. My thighs pump through the air, my thighs pump through the air like tires, rolling down the highway, big and round, eating up the ground of America. But I've never been any further than 42nd Street. Below that is as unfamiliar as my father's face, foreign as the smell of white girls' pussy, white girls on TV, white girls on the bus. My whole world is black and brown and closed till I open it with a rock, christen it with blood. Bop, bop, the music pops through me like electric shocks. My sweat is a river running through my liver green with hate. My veins bulge out like tomorrow. My dick is the Empire State Building. I eat your fear like a chimpanzee, ah, ah, we. My sneakers glide off the cement like white dreams looking out at the world through a cage of cabbage and my mother's fat hollering, don't do this and don't do that. I scream against the restraint of her big ass sitting on my face drowning my dreams in sameness. I'm scared to go, it hurts me to stay. She sits cross-legged in front of the TV telling me no, feeding me, clothing me, bathing me in her ugliness, high, high in the sky, 18th floor of the projects. Her welfare check buys me $85 sneakers but can't buy me a father. She makes cornbread from Jiffy Box Mix, buys me a coat, $400 leather like everybody else's. I wear the best man. 14 karat gold chain I take off before I go wilding. Fuck you, nigga, nobody touches my gold. My name is Leroy, L-E-R-O-Y, bold gold. I got the goods that make the ladies young and old sign your name across my heart. I want you to be my baby. Rapper D, rapper G, rapper I. My name is lightning across the sky. So what I can't read, you supposed to teach me you the teacher, I'm the ape. Black ape and white sneakers, ha, 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 I rape, rape, rape. I do the wild thing. I do the wild thing. My teacher asked me what would I do if I had six months to live. I tell her I'd fuck her, sell dope, and do the wild thing. My thighs are locomotives hurling me through the underbrush of Central Park, the jungle. I either want to be a cop or the biggest dope dealer in Harlem when I grow up. I feel good, it's a man's world, my sound is king. I am the black man's sound. Get off my face, whining bitch. No, I didn't go to school today and I ain't going tomorrow. I like how the sky looks when I'm running. My clothes are new and shiny, my tooth gleams gold. I'm fast as a wolf, I need a rabbit. The sky is falling, calling my name, Leroy, Leroy. I look up, but blood blusting, blood bust in my throat and it's my homeboys. L, D, C, K, and bean butt. Hey man, what's up? I got the moon in my throat. I remember when Christ sucked my dick behind the pulpit. I was six years old. He made me promise not to tell no one. I eat cornbread and collard greens. I only wear Adidas. I'm my own man. They can wear a New Balance or Nike if they want. I wear Adidas. 
I'm LD, lover, move a man with the money, all the girls know me. I'm classified as mildly retarded, but I'm not, at least I don't think I am. Special education classes eat up my brain like last week's greens rotting in plastic containers. My mother never throws away anything. I could kill her. I could kill her. All those years, all those years, I sat, I sat in classes for the mentally retarded so she could get the extra money welfare gives her retarded kids so she could get some motherfucking money. That bitch. I could kill her. All the years I sat next to kids who shitted on themselves, dreaming amid rooms of dull eyes that one day my rhymes would break open the sky and my name would be written across the marquee at the Apollo in bold gold me, bigger than run DMC, rapper G, rapper O, rapper me. Let's go, I scream. My dick is a locomotive. My sister eats it like a 50 cent hot dog. I scream, I said, let's go. It's 40 of us, a black wall of sin. The God of our fathers descends down and blesses us. I say, thank you, Jesus. Now let's do the wild thing. I pop off the cement like toast out of toaster. Hot, hard, crumbling, running, running. The park is green. Combat operation, lost soul, looking for Lieutenant Callie, Jim Jones, anybody who could direct this spurt, uh, this spurt of semen rising to the sky. Soldiers flying through the rhythm. Oh, man, nigga, please, nigga, 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 I know who I am. My soul sinks to its knees and howls under the moon rising full. Let's get a female jogger, I shout into the twilight, looking at the middle class thighs pumping past me, cadres of bitches who deserve to die for thinking they better than me. You ain't better than nobody, bitch. The rock begs my hand to hold it. It says, come on, man. T.W. Pitbull, J.D. and me grabbed the bitch. Ugly, big nose, white bitch, but she's beautiful because she's white. She's beautiful because she's skinny. She's beautiful because she's going to die because her daddy's going to cry. Bitch, I bring the rock down on her head. Sounds dull and flat, like the time I busted the kitten's head. The blood is real and red. My dick rises. I tear off her bra, feel her perfect pink breast like Brooke Shields, like bitches in Playboy. Shit. I come all over myself. I bring the rock down. The sound has rhythm. Hip hop ain't going to stop till your face sees what I see every day. Walls of blood, walls of blood. She's wriggling like a pig in the mud. I never seen a pig or a cow step on TV. Her nipples are like hard strawberries. My mouth tastes like pesticide. I fart. Yousef slams her across the face with a pipe. My dick won't get hard no more. I bring the rock down, removing what she looks like forever. Ugly bitch, ugly bitch. I get up, blood on my hands, semen in my jeans. The sky is black, the trees are green. I feel good, baby. I just did the wild thing. That, uh, that book of poems, American Dreams, ends with a, a group of poems called the um, Breaking Karma Poems, um, poems that I wrote about my um, relationship with my mother or really about m the, my lack of a relationship with my mother. And so uh, American Dreams ends with um, the Breaking Karma Poems 1, 2, 3, and 4. And my uh, new book of poetry, um, Black Wings and Blind Angels, begins with um, Breaking Karma number five, six, seven, eight, and nine, which uh, ends that sequence of, of poems uh, about my mother. And uh, there, there's seats all down here for people who want to sit down. And seats over there. This is um, Breaking Karma number five. One, it is like a scene in a play. His bald spot shines upward between dark tufts of hair. We are sitting in a pool of light on the plastic covered couch Ernestine, his last live-in ended up with, but that is the end. 
We are sitting in the beginning of our lives now, looking at our father upright in his black reclining chair. It's four of us then, children, new to Los Angeles. Drugs, sex, Watts burning, Aretha, Michael Jackson, the murder of King, haven't happened yet. He is explaining how things will be, which one will cook, which one will clean. Your mama, he announces, is not coming. 2,000 miles away in the yellow linoleum light of her kitchen, my mother is sitting in the easy tan-colored man's lap, kissing him. Her perfect legs golden like whiskey, his white shirt rolled up arms that surround her like the smell of cake baking. Forget about her, my father's voice drops like a curtain. She doesn't want you. She never did. Two, holding the photograph by its serrated edges, staring, I know the dark gray of her lips is jubilee red, her face brown silk. I start with the slick corner of the photograph, put it in my mouth like it's pizza or something. I close my eyes, chew, swallow. And this is um, Breaking Carmen number eight in that series. Okay. One, I haven't seen her in 10, 11 years. I'm 24, 25 years old. My grandmother and aunt have heard I moved to San Francisco. They call all the L's in the book. The conversation is simple. Working where? Going to school where? Chemistry? Yeah, chemistry. I want to be a doctor. I remember them heavy coffee cream colored women, doilies, food, church. I don't remember passion or being loved. There are hills in San Francisco, steep stairways of cement, trolley cars, 1975. The city, is it nice there? Nice. How can I say nice doesn't describe the way my blood gushes, how I bead my hair with tiny red beads, hundreds of them beauty ble bleeding? Yeah, it's nice here, I answer. What do they want now after the rubber hose, the tenderloin tube down my nose and throat? What do they want with me now? What do I need a grandmother and aunt for now, after him, after my father? But I am polite, launder my life, promise to call. Two, why didn't I call? After all, I had the number their tongues wag at me as if I put myself on an airplane at 13 and said goodbye. Well, your mother tried to call, my grandmother insists. She did, I counter. She sent letters, my grandmother asserts. I never got them. Your father probably tore them up. No, he tore us up. No, he would be at work when the mailman came. He, I don't like him, but I can't let this pass. He didn't tear up no letters. She never sent one, none. You never answered our letters or called. No, I admit, trolley cars here. For the first time, I have a room of my own. Think you'll be coming up here anytime soon? Uh, for what? Oh, sure. Oh, well, bye now. We love you, too. My grandmother and aunt call again, awkward. How are you? Church. How do I tell her who she knows is gone? I do tell her he beat me, and I want to tell her you slapped me, twisted my ear rage, but I don't because it wasn't the same. He cast me out, you found me. My grandmother says, I want you to talk with someone, or did she say I have someone here who wants to talk to you? Hello, the voice is thin, cold, and in retrospect, I will realize, drunk. It's your mother, the voice says. I realize she probably got handed the same I have someone here who wants to talk to you line that I got. I chat on a moment about college. My job at the phone company say all right. I can't feel nothing from her side except sinking. It feels like a stone sinking in endless water. I tell her again all right and send her a picture. Because my sister hates to take pictures and my brother already is getting hard to find, I only have one picture of us together a color photo of three smiling, radiantly young people. This time, when they call, I hear the behind-the-scene machinations. Violet, a steel hiss from my grandmother. The sound of the receiver dropping. My aunt, someone wants to talk to you. I wonder who. Hi, Mommy, I say. Sapphire, she asks. No, it's Donald Duck. <laughs> yeah, it's me. Then I remember, did you get the letter, I asked, excited. Yes, she says. Her voice sounds like it's been ironed and frozen, but I don't stop. Did you get the picture, I asked. Yes, yes, she assures me. You look very nice, but who were those other two people? It's me now being laid out on some big board, being ironed and folded, 
froze into a small red speck that turns black in my chest, which is a box closing. Breath, where to find breath. Putting the phone down, everything seems so still and coming apart at the same time, a box in my brain opens and the one that's in my chest closes. And this, this next poem is called, She Asked About My Mother. In therapy, she asked about my mother. I tell her about the moment at the airport. Four children, one mother in a skirt holding a piece of tissue. Child by child, we pass through a turnstile to the plane. The last, I turn and ask, when are you coming? She says she doesn't know when she is coming. I was 13. I would not see my mother again until I was 26. The last time we are all together is in 1963 at the airport. Even then, of course, our father is not there. She is through with him. I walk in the kitchen and a man is holding her. She is in his lap. Once she must have been holding me like that in her lap, me drinking her, her who is not coming, who did not come, never came, who was through being our mother. 23 years later, we will assemble at train stations and airports to pay, as they say, our last respects to a little woman who by the last or in the end was hard to respect. Holding on to this weight, depression, and train stations at the airport, I am afraid the person sent to meet me is not coming. I was 26 when I went to find my mother. In therapy, I passed through the turnstile again. I am through running. At last, I am willing to look at this mother, to look at my uterus holding its hard tumors. It was me who was coming in a pink dress, ponytail, 13, alone at the airport with my brothers and sisters. My brother at the airport, did you notice him? Watch him pass through you a second time. I told him you were not coming. That's the last you'll see of that boy. He will not prove good at holding on. Neither will you, mother. The therapist, even the stranger at the airport asked, where was your mother? It is hard to explain not coming, a mother being through, or me holding on to my uterus swollen with these tumors to the very last. This next poem is called um, Ghost. I actually wrote this while I was, um, uh, I was actually living in um, Brooklyn in, a, um, in a, uh, um, a brownstone in a garden apartment, which is, which is a, uh, actually a euphemism for living in the basement. You know? <laughs> and uh, so then I went away uh, for the summer. I was at, at Yaddo, and they put me in this room which had um, 13, 13 windows. And uh, so, actually, that's uh, not what this poem is about, but um, uh, the windows are mentioned in here, so I thought I'd uh, explain that to you. I, I wish you wouldn't let me. Okay. Ghost. There are 13 windows in this room. I see the tops of trees and sky. My parents run through my mind. My father scurrying like a mouse. My mother is sitting. Why have I come here and what do their ghosts want with me? I know I'm not writing poetry, but trying to build a bridge back to poetry. I will go home to a hot, stuffy room. I have lived with their ghost, the black-haired mother, her parents on her back. We had all, all but one come to bury her 12 years ago. My father died at 75, a stroke. My father, myself, or me, myself. Where is poetry, the feeling I used to have? Will it come in the middle of exercises? Finally, I have a room with windows. Finally, my, my parents are dead, are ghost. How they beat me, left me, laughed at me, are ghost. I see him frozen, hurrying in a picture of my father. I seldom saw my parents together. My mother never mentioned my father's poetry. I found it after he died. I was in his room before his funeral. I had come from New York to bury this father, come to throw dirt on the recovered ghost of memory, willing to believe as I lay down in his room I was a liar. Then my sister says, he got me while I was in diapers. In his poetry, he talks of sunsets and doesn't mention his parents. My mother said he was ashamed of his parents. When it is my time, who will come? 
I have no children except this poetry that isn't poetry. Our father's penis is the ghost we suck in our dreams. Still, I miss that father. Raise him from photographs to come sit in my room. Here at the writer's colony, I attempt poetry in a room. I see my mother and father at the top of the sky. My parents have come here home to help me. Ghost. It's called An Ordinary Evening. My sister tells me it was just an ordinary evening, but evening is never ordinary, is it? Once the sun has started to climb down the sky, things change. You and she were sitting in the den, the olive green vinyl couch, sports trophies, new color TV, pictures of Kennedy and King. We keep turning to the wall plate glass door, concrete steps to the backyard. You were sitting in the den by the tone of your voice. You could have been asking, are there any more hot dogs left or saying, let's go get, hot, let's go get high. She said you just turned around and looked at her and said, let's kill him. Let's kill the old man. And this next poem, uh, interesting, they're side by side with each other. Uh, so this next one is called Blood on the Tracks, or I'm so lonesome I could die. And Blood on the Tracks is from the, uh, is the title of an old Bob Dylan album. And I'm So Lonesome I Could Die is a, a country and, and western song. And in this particular poem, I take on um, the persona. Uh, there's some references in here, so you can, uh, I want you to understand them. <laughs> uh, I take on the persona of the young uh, man, um, actually a couple of them, but uh, the young man who killed uh, John Lennon. So that whole, um, 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 kind of psychopathic personality, and also um, there's a couple references in here to, to also to uh, uh, Hinckley, who was another uh, murderer who focused on uh, famous people. Okay, blood on the tracks, or I'm so lonesome I could die. Train yards, uniforms, stations like flags and steel bathrooms. I ride close to the rail with what I can carry. Coffee light over the long grass that is my country. Rolling with that easy feeling, that dark pop top of light fizzing like a razor blade over the eyeballs of yellow, leaning out the direction of nowhere backwards, rolling with the music that is my time. Loneliness, chrome flicker in the bright boxes of ending briefly, and it was in the 70s I evolved, moved on up, and no longer thought about killing every day. Old people or babies or somebody famous like John Lennon. I understand why he had to die, the damn Dakota, that Japanese bitch all dressed in black, all that dope food, fame, studio time. I dream, fantasize something as American as credit cards and cancer. I fantasize shooting the famous. My wheels rolling fugitive across the life that is a train of losers, Xerox back to back, plastic colored heavy water wrapping around the axle of light breaking like a bullet through the gray chemical smell of the steel shitholes blue water in the black of the bus registered like a holster of discomfort slung on the torn negligee of dry grief and this old bitch who we did the favor of killing doesn't have shit to steal we don't want silverware or crystal we don't want mahogany furniture where's the money bitch she can't talk pit bull she's dead the bottom of the vase is thick crystal grapes I break, pull up the old bitch's nightgown. What you gonna do, spooky? It's 1962, fuck this hoe up. I jam her wrinkled ass with the glass dick. It won't go in, but she bleeds until 1992. Words like borderline psychopath, loser in blue jeans, green light off the cape of dead Kennedy's white water. A bridge collapses and I'm homeless, down to a screwdriver and a dream and the memory of Annette Funicello in a white sweater, black skirt, and a musketeer cap. I know I'm stupid. I know I'm worthless, but I could have been a star, a stupid, worthless star. What I can't be, I kill. Turn to trains to the man snoring in the seat next to me. Wake up, motherfucker, and die. I got a suitcase of hormones, sparkle plenty, and blonde love bones, and I want was born to kill. What I can't get, o can't get over is we never had a chance, and now the dance is over, lying on its back like a disemboweled dog having seizures in the crater of its missing penis. There's a full moon on Main Street, and this pot of lye is going in somebody's eyes. Strawberry feels forever my ass. I hate you. 
You see how Lana Turner went down, and that bitch that used to play kitty on Gunsmoke America does not take care of its own swimming pool of packaged cheeseburgers, broken thigh bone of a dog eaten in the red light of a train track. And if I had it to do all over, I would have murdered my mother and ate that bitch's heart, then rammed the lamp up her pussy so the world could see the knife cut of a tear rolling through cattle yards and remembered music. I remember music I couldn't make, and I want to kill. Damn. This next poem is uh, entitled Sestina. And uh, when, I, when I was in graduate school, I studied with uh, Allen Ginsberg, and I just knew we were going to do the wild thing. And uh, so, but when I got into his class, he said, oh, we all had to, we had, he made us write sonnets and sestinas and villanelles and count this and rhyme that and everything. So anyway, this was my, my uh, response to uh, going home at night and having to learn this thing. Uh, Sestina. Last night after school, I finally got around to looking at the formula for a sestina and thought of crazy horse dancing in the desert, and I asked, is God going to appear here? I want God, a blue light so dark it stains everything for centuries, radiative, hallucinatory, rude, smelling like urine and frankincense. One hip has always been higher, one breast longer, and my thighs and belly at midlife like stupid teenagers are totally out of control. Like Billy and Bessie and Diamond Black Big Maybell, body ballad red dirt rooster throat cut in the sign of the cross sodomized with a black cat bone full moon crossed with lie, road sign turned around early death gunshot untreated TB HIV roach wings floating in the semicircular canal. A white boy in the workshop, hip downtown, grunge, shaves his prematurely bald head, tattoos, you know the whole bit, wonders aloud if roaches get in poor people's ears when they sleep. And a girl says, yeah, yeah, they do. Running like roads out of nowhere, out of lines, and I fall back 25 years before most of these kids were born, and I whisper to Chris, it didn't make any difference which side of the line you were on, did it? When the wheel hit that dip and the motorcycle flipped in the air and the light of a cervical vertebra snapped in infinitum, electrons spinning like wheels around a dying nucleus of light scurrying under cracks in some linoleum in Queens. And sometimes under the concrete the city is walking on, I see the cotton fields my daddy ran away from. And his face, the love pulls me like an eclipse to the worn envelope of poems I found in his drawer when he died. Lines crossed in gasoline burning, and you know those old niggas back then had about as much a chance of making it as butterflies at all switch. Is that why he did it? And now time is a light, dimming as it burns brighter, turning me toward the dark, then the light again, I hope. <laughs> myself some water and Let's see over in this side of the auditorium I have the serious follow along set for those of you I'm on page 85 okay <laughs> And uh, so the, the next um, poem I'm going to read is a, is a prose poem, and it's called uh, My Father Meets God, or The Dream of uh, Forgiveness. And um, so this is uh, a poem exactly about what it, what it says. My Father Meets God, or The Dream of Forgiveness. Such a godly thing, this forgiveness. It's like that scene in Cabin in the Sky. You are at the pearly gates, and like Louis Armstrong or somebody with St. Peter, he's out the picture. But there you are, knobby knees, denting your blue and white striped pajamas, ashy feet, no toupee, you are talking to God. She is, as we didn't know she would be, an overweight Samoan woman. <laughs> she was born in San Francisco, hung out with African-American people, talks like she's black, so this, I guess, is how she gets in Cabin in the Sky. That 
is a question, not an explanation. One thing you can see is she has my mouth. Jesus, she is me. Maybe a past life or some shit. Anyway, she is God, and she is talking to you. She is telling you. God is telling you. She loves you. She is thanking you for the burst of white light that was the sperm that began her life. She thanks you. She thanks you for the money, Daddy. She says she paid off the school loans, quit that sun-up to sun-down job that you ran barefoot on a dirt road away from when you were 14 years old in 1929, third, second generation out of slavery, running from a crazy man who beat you with his foot on your neck till your nose bled. God says when she got the money, she bought some records, pizza with pepperoni, some clothes, like always, like a nigga. A leather, curt, a leather coat arming me against insolvency, bad credit, bounce checks, runaway debt, a mattress on the floor, roaches. But I pay them back, Daddy. I stop Hegel and Hegel from garnishing my check. Get off the hot coals they're dragging me across. Get them off my back. No, I sent many a princess to prep school with that $2,000 principal that rose like generations in ignorance to $12,000 in lawyer's fees. Fuck it. I just give them back their fucking money. Call it restitution. If I ever harmed you, America, if slavery didn't take enough, take it, motherfucker. Daddy, God knew you would want her to go back to school, knew you did not believe we were genetically inferior and that we could learn and get a good job. She knew you would want her to join a pantyhose, be pearled, perfume middle class despite everything. You believed in denial as a, as a survival mechanism, that every day was a new day. What was past was past. They talked about Jesus Christ, didn't they? they you told me when I told you they talked about you. I remember when you said Michael could turn his life around, that plenty of men get out of prison and go on to do something with their lives. He could make it today if he wanted, you had said. Look, do you have much of a chance to talk to him now? Well, maybe after you've been around a while. So, Daddy, I cut the mustard you were always talking about, though I never quite understood where that expression came from. I made my mark, my first one at least. Make your mark, you would always say. I remembered what you said, all that stuff. A man could walk out of prison, out the past, and turn his life around. I knew you weren't talking about me, but I, re but I remembered what you said, and it. I decided not to let it hold me back. I walked away from it by walking into it. Look, look, Daddy, God is showing a movie. It's your life. She's playing it back for you. See, there's your mother's thin legs cocked open. Your head is breaking her apart for the last time. You the seventh son of a son of a gun. Aries born to rule, born to rise. Look, Daddy, there you are, the brightest, the tallest, the youngest boy. Look at you running, look how you strive. Look, look, see daddy, see the flag, red, white, and blue. See you in a uniform defending it. See the woman, her legs open like your mother giving birth. The nurse says, it's a girl, Sergeant Lofton, it's a girl, you are happy. A girl is great, almost as good as a boy. She can't play football, but she can be a nurse, a teacher, be a cheerleader, and go to Mills or Spelman. She's not going to be light, but she's not going to be too dark or have a big nose. She has no excuse for being fat, you will tell her. Neither of her parents are. This is your girl. She is properly dressed and plays with plastic dolls. She loves them like you do Polaroid. Daddy, Daddy, come quick. You're 40. It's 40. The film starts to go faster. Same life, but it's slipping by you even as you rise to the top. Daddy, Daddy, God is talking, very gently, but she's talking. Look, look, she turns your head toward the movie screen, your life. She says, only God, and she is God, can change it. She says, what, Emmanuel Millard, like your mama calls you? She says, Billy, like your daddy calls you. She says, Michael, like you named yourself, or Mike, like you asked the fellas to call you. She says, is there anything you'd like to change? This is your last chance. And you tell her, stop, stop, go back. There's a night, a day, nights, days. My daughter, daughters lie about. 
make my daughter, especially Ramona Sapphire, I like that name, actually. Her mama named her Ramona. I didn't have no say in it. Change it, you hiss. Change it. Make my girl stop lying. Change it or, or, can you erase that? God says, what would you give to change that? You say, I'd go back, back all the way back under the ocean beyond the middle passage. I'd go to the land of cut Achilles, amputated clitorises, mules and men with no tongues. I'd go to where all the tongues that have been cut off go, where blind eyes go. I'd go to grass. I'd go to, be, I'd go to being a one-celled organism. I'd do anything to stop the lying or, or change what I did if I did anything like that. God, God, I'm talking to you. God looks at him, looks around. It's more like the Johnny Otis show now than Cabin in the Sky. Esther Phillips is up there singing, I'm going to Chicago, and I'm sorry, but I can't take you. <laughs> God, I always sat at the table with the white folks. I never could understand why the colored boys in the service always sat together. Me, I would go get my tray and sit at the table with the white soldiers. You know, I'm surprised I'm so happy you're colored. What are you, colored? Well, whatever, you look black, sort of, I'm happy. Is it because you want forgiveness, God asks. No, no, it's because you're so pretty. God, his voice is pleading now. Can you change it? Yes, she says, it is changed. Are you sure? Yes, says God. I know you're God, but give me some proof. Oh, Lord, you men, she says, then snaps. What year is it? Year? Yes, what year is it? Why, it's the day I died. It's November 20th, 1990. Okay, you want proof? Yes, God, you, I believed in you and Jesus. I still believe in you even though you uh, look different. So what did you want proof of exactly? That, that night, those days, that, that something has changed. Well, you know, even though I'm God, I can't change the past. What? What? You lying wench? Why did you say you could if you couldn't? Well, because being God, I could and did. Double talk. Could what, did what, either you can or you can't. Either you did or you did. First is yeah, yeah, anything you want. Now it's just funny stuff. Even though I'm God, I can't change the past. So why did you say you could if you couldn't? Well, because being God, I did. Did what? Change it. I changed it for you. Huh? How? The way you changed the past. Look, look, Daddy. I'm going to roll the film forward. Look, look, Daddy. See your girl run? Look, look. Daddy, see your girl deposit that big check. Look at your girl lift up the people. She's the nurse, teacher, poet, healer you always wanted her to be. Look, look. See Sapphire ch shine. She changed it for you, the past. That's what children are for. Look, look, she's walking. Where? It looks like, yeah, that's 14th Street in New York. She's singing. She can't sing. Why not? Well, I can't sing. It runs in the family. Well, what could she do? You know, I wanted to be a poet. Yes, I know. Well, she's singing, and how come I can't hear if you can hear? Don't be silly. I'm God and her. Of course I can hear. And you're, uh, you know, you're dead. <laughs> I didn't mean that the way it sounded. Anyway, she's singing that Billie Holiday song. You know I saw Billie Holiday at the Apollo, Count Basie, Ella, all of them. What's my daughter singing, and where's she going? She's singing, Mama may have. Papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own. And where's she going? She's on her way to the bank, my bank, where I used to work. You know I was personnel manager for 20 years. I know. I got a pension from the Army and the bank. I own my house. Is that the one you put her out of? I'm sorry. That's the one they'll sell, and she'll pay off her student loans and go back to school. I'm glad. I know you are. Where's she going, God? She going to work. No, right now she's going to the bank to cash in. She works for me now, you know. You? She ain't dead. No, I ain't dead. I'm God. You're dead, Daddy, and your girl works for me, God. <laughs> What's she do? She talks with the cut-off tongue you gave her. She comes with the amputated clitorises. She runs on the severed Achilles. She flies, man. She's a poet. What's she doing? I can't see so clear. She's still singing. What? A new song, something different, different from the past. Yeah, I told you the past has changed, but then you said you can't change the past. She changed it. 
look, see how the past changes, advances into the future. See, you know, I went blind before I died. I know, but you ain't blind no more. Shucks, may as well be I'm dead. You're dead, but now you can see. You can see what you did and what you didn't do. She's all right. Your girl is all right. You hurt her. Hurt her bad, but you didn't kill her. Slowed her down some, but you didn't stop her. Thank God. Oh, thank God. You're welcome. <laughs> so I'm going to turn to the last page of the book now. It's 124. <laughs> and uh, this is a, a poem called um, Today. Today is a day you've been waiting for, when you would finally begin to live, when you would at last open the door. This is the what, the circumstance, the more you have been withholding, saving to give. Today is the day you've been waiting for, when you could sit down to your desk for hours, take pride, time, find out what work is. When you would at last open the door to your own self-development, what God has for you. Today is the day you come out of prison, live. Today is the day you've been waiting for, the tomorrow you pined away yesterday for. I think love rhymes in a way with give. You at last open the door to the possibility of now the core of life is the moment, now how you live. Today is the day I've been waiting for, when you would at last open the door. I'm now going to read from um, my first novel, Push, and um, Push was uh, published in 1996. Uh, it's the story of a young um, African-American girl uh, in Harlem. She's 16 years old, and the book begins, uh, she's pregnant, uh, and she's actually pregnant for the second time. And um, uh, our protagonist has fallen through all the proverbial safety nets, uh, they just have not existed for her. And um, not only is she pregnant, she can't read, she can't write, you know, she's a, a, a big ball of statistics. But uh, I'll let her tell you about it. So the, most of the story is written in the first person and uh, I'm gonna begin at the beginning with her telling you a little bit about herself. I was left back when I was 12 because I, because I had a baby for my father. That was in 1983. I was out of school for a year. This is gonna be my second baby. My daughter got down, Cinder. She's retarded. I had got left back in the second grade too when I was seven because I couldn't read and I still peed on myself. I should be in the 11th grade getting ready to go into the 12th grade so I can go on and graduate, but I'm not. I'm in the ninth grade. I got suspended from school because I'm pregnant, which I don't think is fair. I ain't did nothing. My name is Clarice Precious Jones. I don't know why I'm telling you that. Guess because I don't know how far I'm going to go with this story or whether it's even a story or why I'm talking. Whether I'm going to start from the beginning or right from here or two weeks from now. Two weeks from now? Sure, you can do anything when you're talking and writing. It's not like living when you can only do what you're doing. Some people tell a story and it don't make no sense to be true, but I'm going to try to make sense and tell the truth. Else, what's the fucking use? Ain't there enough lies and shit out there already? So, okay. It's Thursday, September 24, 1987, and I'm walking down the hall. I look good, smell good, clean, fresh. It's hot, but I do not take off my leather jacket. Even though it's hot, it might get stolen or lost. Indian summer, Mr. Witcher say. I don't know why I call it that. What he mean is it's hot, 90 degrees, like summer days. And there is no, none, I mean none, air conditioning in this motherfucking building. The building I'm talking about is, of course, Intermediate School 146 on 134th Street between Lenox Avenue and Adam Clayton Powell Jr. Boulevard. I'm walking down the hall from homeroom to first period math. Now, why they put some shit like math first period, I do not know. <laughs> Maybe to go on and get it over with. I actually don't mind math as much as I had thought I would. 
I just fall in Mr. Witch's class, sit down. We don't have assigned seats in Mr. Witch's class. We can sit anywhere we want. I sit in the same seat every day in the back last row next to the door, even though I know that back door be locked. I don't say nothing to him. He don't say nothing to me. Now that is. First day he say, class, turn the book pages to page 122. I don't move. He say, Miss Jones, I said turn the book pages to page 122. I say, motherfucker, I ain't deaf. The whole class laughed. He turned red. He slammed his hand down on the book and say, try to have some discipline. He is a skinny little white man, about five feet four inches, a peck of wood, as my mother would say. I look at him and say, I can slam too. You want to slam? And I pick up my book and slam it down on the desk hard. The class laughs some more. He say, Miss Jones, I would appreciate it if you leave the room right now. I say, I ain't going nowhere, motherfucker, till the bell ring. I came here to learn math, and you're going to teach me. He looked like a bitch just got a train pulled on her. He don't know what to do. He try to recoup, be cool, say, well, if you want to learn, calm down. I'm calm, I tell him. He say, if you want to learn, shut up and open your book. His face is red. He is shaking. I back off. I have won, I guess. I didn't want to hurt him or embarrass him like that, you know. But I couldn't let him, anybody know page 122 look like page 152, three, six, five. All the pages look alike to me. And I really do want to learn. Every day I tell myself something going to happen, some shit like on TV. I'm going to break through or somebody going to break through to me. I'm going to learn, catch up, be normal, change my seat to the front of the class. But again, it has not been that day. But that's the first day I'm telling you about. Today is not the first day. And like I said, I was on my way to math class when Miss Lichtenstein snatched me out the hall to her office. I'm really mad because actually I like math even though I don't do nothing, don't open my book even. I just sit there for 50 minutes. I don't cause trouble. In fact, some of the other natives get restless. I break on them. I say, shut up, motherfuckers. I'm trying to learn something. <laughs> First, they laugh like trying to pull me into fucking with Mr. Witcher and disrupting the class. Then I get up and say, shut up, motherfuckers. I'm trying to learn something. The coons clowning look confused. Mr. Witcher look confused. <laughs> but I'm big, 5 feet 9, 10. I weigh over 200 pounds. The other kids are scared of me. Coon fool, I tell one kid done jumped up, sit down, and stop acting silly. Mr. Witcher look at me confused, but grateful. <laughs> I'm like the police is for Mr. Witcher. I keep law and order. I like him. I pretend he is my husband, and we live together in Westchester, wherever that is. <laughs> I can see by his eyes, Mr. Witcher like me too. I wish I could tell him about the pages all being the same, but I can't. I'm getting pretty good grades. I usually do. I just want to go and get the fuck out of intermediate school and go to high school and get my diploma. So anyway, I'm in Miss Lichtenstein's office. She's looking at me. I'm looking at her. I don't say nothing. Finally, she say, so Clarice, I see we're expecting a little visitor. But it's not like a question she's telling me. I still don't say nothing. She's staring at me from behind a big wooden desk. She got a white bitch hands folded together on top of the desk. Clarice, everybody called me Precious. I got three names, Clarice, Precious, Jones. Only motherfuckers I hate call me Clarice. How old are you, Clarice? White cunt box got my file on her desk. I see it. I ain't that late to lunch. Bitch, know how old I am. <laughs> 16 is a rather, uh, she clear her throat. Old to still be in junior high school. I still don't say nothing. She knows so much, let her ass do the talking. <laughs> Come now, you are pregnant, aren't you, Clarice? She asked, and now a few seconds ago, the hoe just knew what I was. <laughs> Clarice, she trying to talk all gentle now and shit. Clarice, I'm talking to you. I still don't say nothing. This hoe is keeping me from math class. I like math class. Mr. Witcher like me in there, need me to keep those rowdy niggas in check. He nice, wear a dope suit every day. He do not come to school looking like some of these other nasty ass teachers. Look, I don't want to miss no more math class, I tell stupid ass Miss Lichtenstein. She look at me like I said I want to suck a dog's dick or some shit. <laughs> What's with this cunt bucket? That's what my mother called women she don't like. 
cunt buckets. I kind of get it, and I kind of don't get it. But I like the way it sounds, so I say it too. I get up to go. Miss Lichtenstein asked me to please sit down. She not through with me yet. But I'm through with her, that's what she don't get. This is your second baby, she says. I wonder what else it's saying in that file with my name on it. I hate her. I think we should have a parent-teacher conference, Clarice. Me, you, and your mom. For what I say? I ain't done nothing. I do my work, I ain't in no trouble, and my grades is very good. Miss Lichtenstein look at me like I got three arms or a bad odor out my pussy or something. <laughs> what my mother going to do, I want to say. What is my mother going to do? But I don't say that. I just say my mother is busy. Well, maybe I could arrange to come over your house. The look on my face must have hit her, which is what I was going to do if she said one more word. <laughs> come over my house? Nosy-ass white bitch, I don't think so. We don't be coming to your house in Westchester where the fuck you freaks live. Well, I'll be damned. I done heard everything. White bitch want to come visit. Well then, Clarice, I'm afraid I'm going to have to suspend you. For what? You're pregnant. You can't suspend me for being pregnant. I got rights. Your attitude, Clarice, is one of to I reached over the desk. I was going to yank her fat ass out that chair, but she fell backwards trying to get away from me and started screaming, security, security. <laughs> I was out the door and on the street, and I could still hear her stupid ass screaming, security, security. <laughs> so anyway, Precious's altercation with uh, Miss Lichtenstein results in her getting kicked out of school. And now we're going to go to her house where her, her mother, um, who's kind of basically is also her abuser, it, but has also been pretty oblivious to her. Her mother is now noticing that Precious is um, pregnant for the second time. And in this scene, we, she flashes back to the memory of when she first gave birth to uh, her child, uh, the first child at 12. Precious, that's my mother calling me. I don't say nothing. She been staring at my stomach. I know what's coming. I keep washing dishes. We had fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and Wonder Bread for dinner. I don't know how many months pregnant I am. I don't want to stand here and hear Mama call me slut, holler and shout on me all day like she did the last time. Slut, nasty ass tramp, what you been doing? Who, who, who like Al in Walt Disney movie I seen one time? Who, you want to know who? Clarice, Precious Jones, I'm talking to you. I still don't answer her. I was standing at the sink the last time I was pregnant when them pains hit. I never felt no shit like that before. Sweat was breaking out on my forehead. Pain like fire was eating me up. I just standing there and pain hit me, then pain go sit down, and then pain get up and hit me harder. And she's standing there screaming at me. Slut, goddamn slut, you fucking cow. I don't believe it. Right under my nose you been hightailing around here. Pain hit me again, then she hit me. I'm on the floor groaning, Mommy, please, Mommy, please, please, Mommy, Mommy, Mommy. And she kicked me side of my face. Whore, whore, she's screaming. Then Miss West lived down the hall, pounding on the door, hollering, Mary, Mary, what you doing? You're going to kill that child. She need help, not no beating. Is you crazy? Mama says she should have told me she was pregnant. Jesus, Mary, you didn't know. I knew the whole building knew. Don't tell me nothing about my own child. 911, 911. Miss West screaming now. She called Mama a fool. Pain walking on me now, just stomping on me. I can't see here. I just screaming, Mommy, Mommy. Some men, these ambulance men, I don't see them or hear them come in, but I look up from the pain and he there, this Spanish guy in EMS uniform. He pushed me back on a cushion. I'm like in a ball from the pain. He say, Relax, the pain stabbing me with a knife and this spick talking about relax. He touched my forehead, put his other hand on the side of my belly. What's your name, he say, huh, I say? Your name, Precious, I say. He say, Precious, it's almost here. I want you to push. You hear me, mommy? When that shit hit you again, go with it, Precious Sita, and push. And I did. And always after that, I look for someone with his face and eyes and Spanish people. He coffee cream color, good hair, I remember that. God, I think he was God. No man was never nice like that to me before. I asked at the hospital behind him, where that guy help me? They say, hush girl, you just had a baby. 
but I can't hush because they keep asking me questions. My name, Precious Jones, Clarice Precious Jones to be exact. Birth date, November 4, 1970. Where? Here I say, right here in Harlem Hospital. 1970, the nurse say quiet, confused. Then she say, how old are you? I say, 12. I was heavy at 12, too. Nobody get I'm 12 unless I tell them. I'm tall. I just know I'm over 200 because the needle on the scale in the bathroom stopped there. don't go no further. Last time they want to weigh me at school, I say, no, why for? I know I'm fat, so what? Next topic for the day. <laughs> but this not school nurse now, this Harlem hospital where I was born did where me and my baby got took it after it was born it on the kitchen floor at 444 Lenox Avenue. And this nurse, slim, butter-colored woman, she lighter than some Spanish women's, but I know she black. I can tell it's something about being a nigga ain't color. This nurse, same as me. A lot of black people with nurse cap or big car, light skin, same as me, but don't know it. I'm so tired, I just want to disappear. I wish Miss Butter would leave me alone, but she's just staring at me, her eyes getting bigger and bigger. She, na she says she need to get some more information for the birth certificate. It's still tripping me out that I had a baby. I mean, I knew I was pregnant, knew how I got pregnant. I've been knowing a man put his dick in you, gush white stuff in your booty, you could get pregnant. I'm 12 now. I've been knowing about that since I was five or six. Maybe I always known about pussy and dick. I can't remember not knowing, no. I can't remember a time I did not know, but that's all I knowed. I didn't know how long it take, what's happening inside, nothing. I didn't know nothing. The nurse is saying something I don't hear. I hear the kids at school. Boys say I'm laughing ugly. He say Clarice is so ugly she laughing ugly. His friends say, no, nah, that fat bitch is crying ugly. Laugh, laugh. Why I'm thinking about those stupid boys now, I do not know. Mother, she say, what's your mother's name? I say Mary L. Johnston. L for Lee, but my mother don't like Lee. Sound too country. Where your mother born, she say. I say Greenwood, Mississippi. Nurse say, you ever been there? I say, no, I never been nowhere. She say, reason I ask is I'm from Greenwood, Mississippi myself. I say, oh, because I know I'm supposed to say something. <laughs> Father, she say, what's your daddy's name? Carl Kenwood Jones, born in the Bronx. She say, what's the, fa what's the baby's father's name? I say, Carl Kenwood Jones, born in the same Bronx. She quiet, quiet, say, shame, that's a shame. 12 years old, 12 years old. She say over and over like she crazy in some shop or something. She look at me, butter skin, light eyes. I know boys love her. She say, was you ever? I mean, did you ever get to be a child? That's a stupid question. Did I ever get to be a child? I am a child. I'm confused, tired. I tell her I want to go to sleep. She put the bed down. I do go to sleep. Somebody else there when I wake up, it's like the police or something, want to ask me some question. I ask them, where's my baby? I know I had one. Knew somebody in nurse cap sweet smiled me and say, yes, yes, Miss Jones, you surely did. She moves the men in uniform suits back from my bed. Say my baby is in special intense care and I will get to see her soon. And won't I please answer the nice man's question? But they ain't nice men. They pigs, police. I ain't crazy. I don't tell them nothing. Precious, precious. My mother hollering, but my head not here. It isn't four years ago when I had the first baby. I was standing at this sink when the pain hit me, and she hit me. Precious. My hand slipped down in the dishwater, grabbed the butcher knife. She better not hit me again. I ain't lying. If she hit me this time, I'll stab her ass to death. Precious, you done lost your mind just standing up there staring into spaces. I'm talking to you like that's something. I was thinking, I say, you thinking while I'm talking to you? She say, this like I'm burning $100 bills. <laughs> the buzzer ring. I wonder who it could be. Don't nobody ring our bell unless it's crack addicts trying to get in the building. You know, I, actually, I hate crack addicts. They get the whole race a bad name. Go tell them assholes to stop ringing the bell, my mother say. Now, she closer to the door than me, but I mean my mother don't move unless she have to. When I go to answer the buzzer, I realize I'm still grabbing the knife. I hate my mother sometimes. She is ugly, I think, sometimes. I press talk on the intercom and holler, stop ringing the goddamn buzzer and go back to the kitchen to finish the dishes. 
the buzzer ring again. I go back, stop ringing the goddamn buzzer, I say again. The motherfucker ring again. Stop it, it ring again. Stop it, I shout again, it ring again. My mother jump in and say, press missing, stupid. I want to say I ain't stupid, but I know I am, so I don't say nothing. Because also, I don't want her to go hit me, because I know from my hand in the dishwater holding the butcher knife, I'm through being hit. I'm going to stab her if she ever hit Precious Jones again. I press missing. It's, it's Sandra Lichtenstein for Clarice Jones and Miss Mary Johnston. <laughs> Miss Lichtenstein, what that hoe want? She want me to hit her for real this time? Who that precious, my mother say? I say, white bitch from school. What she want, my mother say? I don't know. Ask her, my mother say. I press talk and say, what you want? And I press lis listen, and Miss Lichtenstein say, I want to talk to you about your education. This bitch crazy. I was going to school every day till a hunky ass snatched me out the hall, fuck with my mind, make me go off on her, suspend me from school just because I'm pregnant, you know, end up my education. Now her white ass out on Lenox Avenue talking about she want to talk to me about my education. Lord, where is crack addicts when you need them? <laughs> what all this about, precious, my mother asked. My mother don't want no white shit like Miss Lichtenstein, social worker, teacher ass nosing around here. My mother don't want to get cut off welfare, that is, and that's what white shit like Miss Lichtenstein coming to visit result in. Now, if I wasn't pregnant and having trouble with the stairs, I'd run down and kick her ass. My mother would say, 86, that bitch. I say it's into the intercom. Hasta la vista, baby. That's Spanish for goodbye, but when niggas say it, it's like kiss my ass. <laughs> Ring go buzzer again. I don't believe this retarded hoe. I press talk, say, get out of here, Miss Lichtenstein, before I kick your ass. The bell go ring. I press listen. Clarice, I'm so sorry about Thursday. I had only wanted to help you. I, Mr. Witcher says you're one of his best students, that you have an aptitude for math. She paused like she's thinking what to say next. Then she say, I've called a Miss McKnight at Higher Education Alternative, each one teach one. It's an alternative school. She paused again, say, Clarice, are you listening? I press talk. Yeah, I say. OK, as I was saying, I've called Mrs. McKnight at each one teach one. It's located on the 19th floor of the Hotel Teresa on 125th Street. That's not too far from here. I press talk. I know where the Hotel Teresa is, I say to her. Bitch, I say to myself. I press listen again. These crackers think you don't know nothing. She say, the telephone number is 555-0831. I told them about you. Miss Lichtenstein stopped. Call or just drop in the 19th floor. I press talk, tell her I heard her the first time. My heart is all warm, half of it at least. Think about Mr. Witcher saying I'm a good student. <laughs> the other half could just jump out my chest and kick Miss Lichtenstein's ass. No more rings, so I guess that means she got the message. I go to sleep thinking, 19th floor, Hotel Teresa, an alternative. I don't know what an alternative is, but I feel I want to know. 19th floor, that's the last words I think before I go to sleep. I dream I'm in an elevator that's going up, up so far, I think I'm dying. The elevator open, and it's the coffee cream colored man from Spanish talk land. I recognize him from when I was having my baby bleeding on the kitchen floor. He put his hand on my forehead again and whisper, push, precious, you're going to have to push. Thank you very, very much. It's your turn now. <laughs> yeah. So you raise your hand, and then the microphone is going to come to you, and you'll uh, say your question in the microphone. Could you tell? Could you tell us how you got published in New Yorker magazine? It's a far cry from Push, the New Yorker magazine. How did you get uh, published? That's where I first uh, read. Uh, oh, okay. Read. How did I get published in the New Yorker magazine? 
Um, well, I was one of one of the people I studied with was um, Avan Bolin, and she was uh, talking with um, um, Alice Quinn, and she inquired about my work. And I also had worked with um, at the New York Poets Cafe with Bob Holman, and um, Miss Quinn had inquired about my work several years ago. And at that time, I for a lot of different reasons I didn't I was busy I didn't send uh, the work that she requested um, or wanted to see to um, the New Yorker and uh, then when I um, signed the contract for a push uh, um, my editor uh, at that time sent uh, a section or the whole book actually to the New Yorker and Alice Quinn was excited about uh, even though she's the ba she's a poetry editor she was uh, uh, putting together the issue of uh, working with some other editors, putting together the issue of the Black New Yorker, and uh, she felt that uh, an excerpt from um, Push would go well in that particular edition of the New Yorker. So that is how it got into um, the New Yorker. Hi, thank you. Um, much props for Push. Um, I'm a teacher in San Francisco's Writers' Corps program, and um, I understand that you've done uh, some teaching yourself, mm -hmm. uh, inner city work too. Um, how did you handle uh, these bouts with cynicism on, and uh, the overwhelming hopelessness um, associated with this kind of work? Okay, well, you know, I was in um, I was in a lot of positions where. Um, the students uh, in, in my class, uh, this, so this was before Clinton ended welfare as we knew it, you know what I mean? And so we had, there were a lot of alternative settings, there were a lot of uh, settings for um, uh, people on uh, welfare, people who had, were no longer uh, in the mainstream school system, which there is a lot of hopelessness and cynicism. So I was really in a, a lot of settings that were quite hopeful and uh, that uh, where people really wanted to go to school and what really, uh, despite overwhelming odds, were really trying to do something with, with, their, with their lives. Um, it's interesting, this year I just completed my first year of um, teaching at a university, and I encountered more hopelessness and cynicism among the, the middle class and uh, upper middle class white youth than I've ever encountered uh, in, uh, in Harlem. So I, I, don't, I don't think that, that's necessarily, um, you know, a, a character trait of um, the inner of inner city youth. I think that the system has uh, failed over and over again, and that the, by the time people have been teaching 15 and 20 years, they're burnt out. And maybe should go on to do something else, but they're holding on for their pension, and uh, they become very uh, disillusioned and bitter, and they pass that that feeling of uh, low expectation and um, and uh, hopelessness on to their students. You know. Are you ever afraid of being so honest? Well, no. I mean, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm as honest as I could get, but I could get more honest. So, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm afraid to get more honest. Uh, so, um, that's my answer to that. <laughs> okay. Over here. Uh, good evening. I really enjoyed your uh, reading. This is my first uh, time hearing you. Mm -hmm. My son is a writer, or he's trying to be a writer, and mm -hmm. he used to send me copies of things that he w had written. And I, of course, would all say, oh my God, I think your language, you need, really need to calm down your language. <laughs> <laughs> so he's gonna be really happy about this night. <laughs> what my question is, <laughs> similar to what the young lady was asking, how are you ever worried about that you go too far as far as language? Um, is there a line between vulgarity and honesty? Um, yeah, yeah, I, th I think you can probably go too far. I don't think I've gone too far, you know what I mean? Um, but I think in, in, we're always, as artists, we're always trying to push our limits, so in my, um, my medium is uh, is language, and so I do have a tendency to push it, you know. And um, I'm 
trying often to approximate the, the language that I hear around me. Uh, so, in, and a lot of what I write is, is what I've actually heard, you know what I mean? Um, I do think that you have to do something with that language. I mean, so in, um, in push the, the violence or the, um, so the profanity or is not just gratuitous, you know, I, I'm using it for a reason. I'm trying to show you this, this, this child, you know, uh, how, how she talks, the, the difference between how she actually, uh, what she says and what she really feels. And, and, and also, this is the language that she has available to her. She uses the language that she has, that she's heard for mo most of her life. Um, so does that answer your question? Okay. We have time for one more. Okay. Besides studying with Ginsburg, who else would you consider to be your poetic influences? Oh, I, th I think that um, my poetic influences would be almost everyone I've ever read. So, you know, so that goes into, um, you know, I, I'm, a lot of my poetry is influenced by the novelists I've read, you know, Larry, Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, Ernest Gaines, a lot of pushes influenced by uh, Ernest Gaines, A Lesson Before Dying. Uh, um, so, so those are a lot of um, influences I draw on, you know, um, in some ways pushes um, a protest novel, and then we go back to what Richard Wright was doing in, in Native Son. I uh, read the early, uh, not the early, all of James Baldwin's novels, some of which are, were set in Harlem, uh, and Petrie the Street, all of that was uh, set in Harlem. Um, oh, I can't, uh, you know, I just have read so many poets, especially black ones, so I'm thinking right here in San Francisco when I was here, uh, going to San Francisco City College, who did I read? Sonia Sanchez, Don L. Lee, Nikki Giovanni, uh, Jane Cortez, um, all, all those people. Um, then later reading Lucille Clifton. Um, uh, I don't know, who are some of your poetic influences? Tell me and I'll tell you <laughs> if, if they're the same. Who do you like? Right. Well, he's the best. He's a, a national treasure. Yes, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, yeah. I I really like the poetry a lot of uh, Willie Perdomo and uh, uh, Paul Beatty. All of those people came out of uh, the the New Yorkian and have um, done really really fine fine work. 